Crime Awareness Day, which is February 28th. Uh, this is a time for us to really talk about HIV decriminalization work. And the Health Not Prisons Collective is really hosting this founders panel today to really talk about how Health Not Prisons, also called H&P, emerge as a formation which is committed to advancing racial justice, Black liberation, and the meaningful involvement of communities duly impacted by HIV and policing in HIV decriminalization movements. So please join us as we welcome H&P founding members Nana Kana from Positive Women's Network, Sean Strube from the CERO Project, also Cecilia Chung from the Transgender Law Center, Charles Steffens from the Counter Narrative Project, and Andrew Splendor from the USPL HIV Caucus. As we really delve in and talk more about why today is so important and why the HMP Collective came about. And I would like for each of the panelists to really introduce themselves. If you all could give us your names, your pronouns and the organizations that you're representing here today. And I'm gonna start off with Sean. Uh, great, uh, hi, I'm Sean Stroop, uh, he, him pronouns. Um, I am um, a long time activist and uh, been part of uh, the CERO project since the beginning and um, I'm delighted to be here and really proud of what uh, our collaboration has accomplished through the Help Not Prisons collaboration. Thank you so much, Sean, for being here. Um, next up, can we have Charles? If you could introduce yourself, give us your pronouns and tell us a little bit about your involvement with h &P. Hi, everyone. I'm Charles Stevens, pronouns he and him, I'm the founder and executive director of CNP. My uh, involvement with Health Not Prisons has been, I think, uh, an amazing um, journey. I continue to be grateful to work with some of the courageous, most courageous people I've ever met. I've learned so much. And I really do believe that being a co-founder of this incredible body is one of the great, 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 great um, accomplishments that I that I think I that I that I have and and I continue to to be just truly full from all the inspiration that I've I've gained. Thank you so much, Charles. Um, Nana. If you could introduce yourself for us. Sure. Hi, everyone. Nana Kana, they or she pronouns, founding director of Positive Women's Network USA. Um, I would have to echo Charles. It has just been such a, an incredible journey alongside these inspiring movement building leaders. Um, I'm really excited to dive into a conversation about why Health Not Prisons came to be and what we hope for the future of Health Not Prisons. Thank you so much for that, Nana. And last but not least, Andrew. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to the webinar. Um, I'm Andy Spieldener, he, him pronouns. I um, I'm the executive director of an organization called Impact Global Action. I'm here representing the U.S. People Living with HIV Caucus, which I was proud to be a member of, and I'm an emeritus member still, but uh, I held positions there for over 10 years, um, which is an amazing network, uh, national network uh, of people living with HIV in the U.S. And uh, I'm a longtime HIV activist um, dating back to the early 90s, and um, h and was kind of a radical vision of what we could do, and I was really happy to participate in it and help encourage its growth and birth, and um, really glad to be here. So thank you all. Definitely. And I just want to say thank you all for all of the hard work that you all have done to create the h &P Collective. As a former Health Not Prisons advocate, I can't say enough about how much it has really helped my own leadership and knowing more about HIV criminalization and really delving into all the complexities that may come along with that. So I just want to say uh, just a quick thank you for all of the work that you all have done to start h &P. Um, I think my first question is really going to be for Sean. Oh, before we get into that, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the h &P Collective. So the Health Not Prisons Collective, or h &P, as we lovingly call it, because you know we acronize everything in HIV, is an intersectional national uh, initiative that was launched in 2020 by the Counter Narrative Project, Positive Women's Network, CERO Project, Transgender Law Center, 
and the U.S. People Living with HIV Caucus. It's really a longtime collaborators led by and accountable to communities most affected by HIV criminalization in the United States. Our strategy incorporates education and training, grassroots and grass tops organizing, policy analysis and advocacy, legal intervention, and narrative change, which is really designed to shift discourses around HIV, risk and blame, responsibility, and the role of the carceral state, including detention centering, racial, and also gender justice. So to learn more about HMP and Health Not Prisons Collective, uh, go to healthnotprisons.org. Also, there's also, um, they're also on social media. So definitely look them up at HMP Collective on Instagram and also Facebook. So uh, without further ado, I wanna get into our first question for today. Um, for, and this is gonna be for Sean. Zero was one of the first organizations to really take on HIV criminalization. Can you talk a little bit about the landscape of organizing to really end HIV criminalization? And what was it like when CIRO was first founded? Uh, sure, uh, thank you. Um, make sure my microphone's on, it is. Um, I mean, the roots of the movement to address HIV criminalization are, 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 are deep and many. Um, and I guess I first sort of became conscious of this sort of threat very early in the epidemic when there were uh, measures to quarantine people with HIV, uh, uh, you know, let alone, you know, uh, getting to the point of, of criminalizing and prosecuting people. A lot of people forget that in 1985, there's a ballot initiative in California uh, to quarantine people with HIV that was ahead in the polls much of that summer. Um, and I was very involved in the no one 64, the LaRouche initiative to stop it. Um, at that time, early in the epidemic, and these states were passing these statutes uh, in the 80s, even before the CDC, the Ryan White funding, uh, ended up incenting states to pass statutes. Uh, at the time, uh, some of the criminalization statutes were, in fact, compromises that were accepted by the community. The executive director of Lambda testified in favor of one at the time. Uh, because the alternative uh, was a, a quarantine statute. So just the context to you know, sort of under, under, understand that at the time. Um, one of the first cases that really got attention was Greg Smith in uh, Trenton, New Jersey, and we were covering that in pause uh, early on. And then um, in 1999 or 98, um, uh, Phil Wilson was a guest editing a special issue of Pause for us on Africa. And we went to South Africa and we stayed with Justice Edwin Cameron, uh, a, a judge who was openly positive and who had already been doing quite a bit of work on criminalization and speaking about it. And I came back and, and then Laura Whitehorn, one of our senior editors at Pause, put together a cover story called America's Most Unwanted that I think was probably the first so at least in any consumer press compilation of cases and beginning to uh, explain that issue. Um, in the, around 2006 or seven, um, I was becoming very concerned that the erosion of the networks of people with HIV, the network movement, which was so important in the 80s and 90s with combination therapy came out, the funding and sort of prioritization of that uh, even the prioritization of service providers to get someone together with other people with HIV after they were diagnosed had declined precipitously. And I was looking to, uh, to create an effort to support and encourage and facilitate the creation of, of networks, whether they're based on demographics or geographics or you know, shared interests or whatever. And uh, at the same time, uh, I was acutely aware of the sort of increasing stigma that this HIV related stigma was getting worse, even as the biomedical consequences of having HIV uh, for those with access to treatment were profoundly different. Um, and to me, stigma uh, 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 and empowerment are two sides of the same coin. And HIV criminalization, when the government makes different statutes based on immutable characteristics of its citizens, uh, is the most extreme manifestation of stigma. Um, so this priority, which to be frank, was really around building networks um, 
uh, and the growing specter of criminalization was one of the reasons why, uh, uh, at least I believe that was so important. And but I found very little support from it from a lot of the policy leadership at the major uh, uh, policy groups and AIDS organizations. It was uh, coincident with the time when they were facing really severe budget issues and struggling to keep their doors open. Um, there was little understanding of it. Um, there were a number of, including you know, prominent people in, in our community of uh, leadership, of people with HIV, who, uh, if not explicitly favoring criminalization statutes, uh, they certainly didn't see it as a priority. And frequently, when there were was coverage of a case, um, they would, you know, the reporter would go to the local aid service provider to ask for comment on it, and the comments were often, well, there are a few bad apples in every bunch, and you know, it wasn't to the profound injustice and, and public health threat that these criminalization statutes posed. It was it was excusing them. Um, the um, I was involved with a group that was a very modest funder. And the very first grant I made was a small grant to uh, the Center for HIV Law and Policy because Catherine Hansen had left Lambda, started CHLP, and had started documenting some of the cases, doing a little bit of analysis around some of the cases, uh, and was just about the only, I mean, I'm not saying no one else was doing it, but, but that was certainly one I was most prominent or most familiar with, and we were covering that work in, uh, in PAWS. That led to creating something called the Positive Justice Project, um, and then I really felt we needed something that was explicitly um, coming from the community of people with HIV themselves. Uh, and uh, my frustration with the policy leaders uh, really led me to kind of look the other direction to the people who had been criminalized and reaching out to uh, uh, various people, uh, uh, Monique Moray in South Carolina, uh, Nick Rhodes in Iowa, and um, most importantly, Robert Suttle in Louisiana, uh, who reached out to me after reading something that I had written uh, just a couple of days after he was released from, uh, from prison. And um, that led to creating the, the short film I did, uh, HIV is Not a Crime, that featured Robert and Monique and Nick, and then the creation of the CERO project uh, and very soon after that, Robert um, moving to where I live in Pennsylvania and working with me on the CERO project and kind of growing it from there. Um, in terms of other work that was underway, I noted that CHLP had been documenting cases, International Planned Parenthood, Global Network of People Living with HIV, and a UN Development Program had all been doing bits and pieces around this. I think the Athena project had done something as well. Um, and Project Unshackle and part of the CHAMP group was looking at criminalization as part of the broader issues around the carceral state. Um, so that was kind of how it how it began. Uh, I will tell you that that you know early on there was uh, um, especially in the sort of you know gay activist community um, a fair amount of resistance. Uh, you know I remember being at a dinner party with a group of people and was talking about what I was doing, why this was important. And, and someone, you know, sort of said, Sean, let me understand this. You're, you're fighting to make it legal for you to infect people. Um, you know, that was not an uncommon attitude around this in some quarters. Um, even the phrase HIV is not a crime, uh, which I think was first used by International Planned Parenthood, um, uh, people were saying, what do you mean HIV is a crime? I mean, yeah, I've got HIV, it's not a crime. Uh, so there was a huge education um, uh, you know, effort in, in, in the community uh, uh, at the time. So that's kind of the, the, uh, you know, the context. Uh, I remember going to several um, planning meetings for a national AIDS strategy effort. I think it was funded by community people getting together. And, you know, I would bring this up and people would kind of roll their eyes. There, there, were, there were a handful of other people interested in it, but it was a, it was a slow start uh, uh, at first. But I think today, you know, a decade later, uh, uh, really is, is an example of what our community can accomplish when we work together and educate each other and link arms and 
and move forward because what we've accomplished in the last 10 or 12 years is, uh, you know, I think um, uh, profoundly uh, important. Yes, I think it has been amazing. And I think you starting Ciro has really helped the movement. So thank you for that. Um, before we get into the next question, I um, see that Cecilia has joined us. Welcome, Cecilia. Um, Hi, everyone. Here. Before uh, we really get into it, I want to welcome you to the panel. And I uh, would like you to introduce yourself and please give us your pronouns and tell us a little bit about uh, TLC. Okay. And, um, and thank you again. And Welcome to PW and Mariana. Um, I want to um, first say I apologize, you know, like for coming on late. For some reason, I went to the Google Meets link. <laughs> so I ran into Ronald on the link. So, but, um, and then we discovered that, you know, we were on the wrong, wrong chat, and, like wrong platform. So a little bit about me. My name is Cecilia Town. My pronouns are she and her. I work for Transgender Law Center, and what we do is we um, are a legal organization as well as a community organization. So we um, use law and legal advocacy, you know, to change um, to change the laws and policies um, that is harmful to transgender people. And also we organize the community and make sure that um, community have a space to speak for themselves. Thank you for that. Thank you so much for being here, Cecilia. Um, for those who are in the chat, please make sure that you are asking our panel some amazing questions. We have a lot of movement leaders on this panel. And so I just want to make sure that we're asking them everything that you would like um, and that your heart desires to make sure that we continue to have robust discussion. But I also want to ask um, everyone, if you could think about 2019 and go back in time pre-COVID, which seems like forever ago, how did the idea of creating the Health Not Prisons Collective come about? What was really the intervention that you all were seeking to make? What was the vision of h &B? And that's for anyone who would like to start. Well, I can remember the first call I had that is what led to this, and it was from Nana. Uh, and Nana, correct my recollection, but uh, you had been approached with the prospect of uh, pretty significant funding uh, around criminalization work. Uh, I had been predicting this. Actually, in the first few months, of Sarah wrote something about how pharma eventually was going to support efforts to combat criminalization, because as we talked about the phenomenon more and people became more aware of it, it also started to become more cited as a reason not to get tested. Um, it was one of the, the reasons why there was so much urgency to this work. And Nana called me about this, and um, uh, and it was uh, potential funding from Gilead. And we were sort of talking about it and the, the you know pros and significant cons of of, uh, of uh, uh, accepting you know significant funding from a pharmaceutical company. And uh, and I don't know if it was on that first call, but 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 very soon. Uh, we and others decided, you know, one of the best ways to sort of protect against the insidious influence of funding on an organization that it can have is to have it be a collaboration, have it be a number of, of groups collectively deciding the priorities and how we would uh, how would we go about this, that it would kind of give us uh, uh, give us strength to protest to protect the uh, sort of integrity of what we're doing and not just get get um, hijacked by a funding stream. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess I'll add a little bit to that, Sean, and I know that others will have more, more to add, but I think, you know, many of us had already been in deep conversation and dialogue for years about um, the intersections of HIV criminalization with other forms of policing and surveillance and how um, Black, Indigenous, people of color bodies are surveilled differently, how um, the HIV de decriminalization conversation really needed to intersect more deeply with reproductive justice um, and freedom, how we needed to be thinking about 
implications for queer and trans bodies and women and femmes and um, how often the discourse around HIV criminalization was kind of devoid of um, a a real intersectional analysis around power and you know how that resulted in sometimes harmful consequences to particular communities like sex workers for example who um there are you know there are many states where there have been like negotiations around legislation and policy um that, that data consistently shows um you know people who are um who are like allegedly like picked up or profiled for doing sex work who we know certain communities get really targeted for that are also the ones who are uh, most frequently convicted of um, HIV related crimes or who get like sentence enhancements in their prosecution and things like that and who bear the brunt of the um the downstream impacts of um, HIV criminalization and so we really wanted to bring all of that into the conversation and all also to center and elevate the um the perspectives of in particular black indigenous people of color living with hiv um, to make sure that like the south um was also deeply you know represented and that most impacted communities um including many of the communities represented here by the all of these powerful leaders um really had their their voices, their perspectives, their expertise, their analysis centered in the HIV decriminalization movement. And not just as like voices speaking out or like, you know, coming to provide a public comment, but deeply embedded in the process of like crafting our solutions. Um, and we know that we don't legislate ourselves to liberation, but we also understand that um, HIV decriminalization advocacy is one of our many tools and tactics for building power for our people. So how do we really leverage that in the most meaningful way? And so when we were presented with this opportunity for, um, a deep investment in this kind of work, we said, how can we take that to really, um, how do we how do we leverage this to really transform the conditions that our communities are facing and build long-term power for our people? Because we don't win just by um, modernizing, you know, a particular law or statute, then what, what comes next, you know? Um, and I know we'll talk about that more as well. Man, and it sounds like you kind of got us kicked off with HMP. Can you tell me why you chose these particular five organizations as a house for HMP as a home for the Health Not Prisons Collective? Mm. Well, I would say that we chose each other. <laughs> um, you know, we really came together and we were, we had been um, in relationship and in community working on many things together around elevating meaningful involvement of communities impacted by HIV, you know, different various communities and constituencies that we were representing. We had also been fighting through, um, you know, the, the previous presidential administration for um, looking at the intersections of like immigrant rights and justice, racial justice, um, some of us were co-founders together also of HIV Racial Justice Now um, and some other types of spaces. And so, and there are many other, um, you know, movement comrades that we can call into the space. I see, um, you know, I see Johnny Cornegay here with us, um, who is definitely also like, you know, a key thinker and leader and continues to be in the HNP space. Um, also folks like Marco Castro Bajorquez, who I, for me really transformed my analysis and, um, you know, and so many, so many others, some of whom are here with us today and some of whom are here with us as ancestors. Um, but really it was about our, our shared commitment to liberation for our people and to centering those who are most harmed by intersecting systems of violence and elevating those, um, those communities into real power and leadership. Thank you for that. It does seem like you all chose each other and that's so beautiful. Um, what did decriminalization work look like in the past? I know that HMP is really a uh, collective that's really focusing in on making sure that BIPOC folks have leadership in this uh, space of HIV decriminalization. What did it look like before HMP? Andrew? I, yeah, I can jump in. Um, prior, the I think Sean alluded to it, the, the and so did Nana, the work is really piecemeal. 
So it was really done like kind of, there were a few cases here and there, there was some movements, um, you know, no one had really taken on the fact that over, you know, that the entire country had at one point criminalized HIV and that certain states, there was some movement happening um, and it felt like there wasn't a lot of coordination between people. And then the other thing was that objectives differed radically based on who, where people sat. So some groups were very concerned with like finding a case law uh, or, you know, litigating a case to, to undo it. Other people were very concerned with like making sure there was no criminalization in the health code or in the law. But one of the things that we realized as a, as organizations coming together, and and I realized, and I think as a member of the U.S. People Living with HIV Caucus, our conversations uh, evolved over time. Um, what, as we started looking at, like, what are the real things that are undergirding criminalization? And there, you know, realistically, it's not just a law about disclosure or not disclosure. It's about who gets policed, who's who's most likely to get picked up by the police, who's most likely to um, have multiple um, kinds of uh, charges held against them where HIV is just the cherry on the the district attorney's cake. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, and we had these discussions in the caucus where people were like, you know, how is this, you know, why is sex work, for instance, why is sex work decriminalization central to this or trans rights central to this if it's about HIV decrim? And we had to have these discussions where we said, if you're a trans woman of color that gets picked up on the street, presumably because you're a sex worker and then you're revealed you have HIV, you're actually vulnerable for all those other identities too. <laughs> and so that's why we had to kind of, and I think for us, HNP became this kind of vision for the future and a large vision for how people living with HIV come together, recognizing the many intersectional identities we have. Um, and I think prior to that, there was no coordination happening and people, it was very, very like a couple lawyers here and a couple activists here, that kind of thing. Okay, sounds like it was a bit disjointed, but HP really made it a collective of folks. And I love that idea. And I love that you all thought about the folks that are most impacted by the epidemic to be able to lead this work. Um, so I'm going to pass it on over to you, Charles. Over in 2020, shortly after the launch of HP, the world really erupted into this global pandemic, which we now know as COVID 19, and the spat of the visible anti Black police brutality. Um, can you speak to how this really shaped the work of HMP in its early days? Absolutely. Well, uh, one, I, I come to this work uh, as an activist and as an organizer, but also as a narrative strategist. And that means I'm always paying attention to the stories that are being told and, and how our community is being reported on. And so that's just a lens that I bring. And in 2020, certainly there was no uh, shortage of opportunities to pay attention to narratives especially in public health, but also around mass incarceration. One of the things that I'm really um, appreciative of with HMP, and there are many things I'm appreciative of, is as a political home, it's also led by um, BIPOC folks. And there was a time when the HIV decriminalization movement space didn't look like that. Um, I felt like it was a bunch of white lawyers sitting around at a foundation um, table sort of thing. And I think that um, HMP has absolutely had a transformative uh, impact on not only the landscape as it relates to HIV decriminalization, but also in terms of what um, HIV, like just what we think about when we think about HIV movement leaders. My own journey um, also in HIV decriminalization was absolutely shaped by my analysis of the carceral state as an abolitionist. Um, even back in 2014, when I first got involved with this movement, it was also very much around the the Michael uh, the Michael Brown assassination, and just and so in my mind, I was always thinking about both mass incarceration, but also HIV decriminalization as being connected. And so I really um, sought to, in my own journey in this movement, seek to bring the HIV decriminalization conversation into the larger conversation around anti um, anti incarceration, which also means looking at HIV decriminalization beyond just policy reforms, but also in terms of law enforcement, policing, and like all of these other manifestations of, of uh, the carceral state. I also uh, just want to share that I'm um, just going back to the narrative shift piece. You know, um, at CNP, we say that bad, bad narratives lead to bad policies. 
And I think that, you know, one of the things that we're always paying very close attention to is how some of the reporting that we see around HIV, um, the stigmatization of folks with HIV that happens in a lot of journalism, even today in media, how it does have policy implications. And so one of the things that I hope to bring to HMP is not only meeting bad narratives with policy organizing, but narrative meeting narrative. And so in order to really counter these horrific, um, terrible narratives that we absolutely need to bring our artists, our cultural workers, our storytellers, and also our policy advocates, grassroots organizers, and um, you know, uh, just amazing community folks to the table because we have to really shift these narratives. We do, and I think it's so important to also bring it from an artistic perspective um, to be able to shift those narratives. So thank you for that. Um, Nana, did you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I'd love to just talk a little bit about, because we, but one of the things that we also saw in the, um, you know, in the early days of COVID with all these quarantine and isolation laws, y'all remember we were on lockdown, like there were, there was like pandemic lockdowns and those were not being enforced the same for everybody. Right. So there was, it was very well documented that, um, in the early days of these COVID-19 lockdowns, like Black and Latinx folks, especially, there were reports coming out of New York, data coming out of New York that was showing that it was Black and Latinx young people often who were being criminalized for like breaking curfew and breaking quarantine and breaking isolation. And so um, some of the work that... Um, this was really something that we were thinking about at, at HMP in the context of like, how do epidemics, how do pandemics get policed? How are those, what are those implications look like for black bodies? How are those different? Um, you know, and then in the context of like the George Floyd uprising and everything where masses of people were out in the streets and it was a lot of people of color and a lot of black folks out in the streets um, breaking curfew. Uh, you know, breaking curfew and rising up in um, as part of the the 2020 uprising, also during a pandemic. So it was a very um, intense, like political and public health moment. And some of what we did in um, in response to that is work to uplift these connections with um, to make the links for um, for COVID nineteen activists and those who are like trying to fight against. Um, the ways that policing was happening around public health, uh, making the connections, the historical connections with HIV. Um, so we, for example, we did a congressional briefing where we partnered with um, Representative Ayanna Presley, who sponsored a congressional briefing on criminalization, COVID-19 and HIV. Um, and, um, you know, that was something that was designed to really bring attention to some policy solutions that needed to be in place so that our responses to public health more broadly are not just about carcerality, like we're not going to, you know, incarcerate ourselves um, out of um, out of an epidemic and nor should that ever be like an acceptable solution. Um, so really kind of problematizing these things and calling for the um, the justice, the services, the liberation, the dignity that our communities deserve. And I can drop a couple of resources on this. We also wrote a letter to Congress um, urging Congress to stop criminalizing COVID-19. Um, and we're part of producing a report that really looked at these intersections of COVID-19 policing, HIV policing, um, and racial inequities in policing, specifically focused around policing of Black folks in 2020. Um, and so I'll drop a few of these links in the chat just as resources and references as well. But I think we need to be aware that like the next time there's another pandemic, um, because we're not done. It's these same dynamics that will replicate themselves. And that's why our work is to get to the root of the problems around racist policing, racist surveillance, um, and what that means for our people. Sounds like we're going through multi-pandemics, um, Nana. I'm going to pass it on over to you, Sean. Yeah, I just wanted to point out a couple of things that I think are sort of worth um, uh, antecedents to the collaboration Health Not Prisons. Uh, one, I think is very important, was the creation, um, uh, it was Vanessa Johnson's uh, uh, idea of the US PLHIV Caucus, um, which uh, is a network of networks that got, you know, PWN and uh, CERO and, and, and different groups working together and sort of created a collaboration of trust um, 
and um, so I think that was sort of really important for you know sort of setting the stage for um, uh, the uh, HNP. Uh, and I think you know while and I think a, 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 another factor you know Cecilia who was you know our founding board chair board chair for many many years also was very involved I don't know if you were on the board of just attention and that was sort of what first started to bring looking at the broader carcel issues uh, into CERO. Um, uh, so I just wanted to kind of note um, those two things because I think they are they both contributed to the success of, of this uh, collaboration. Um, maybe I can add a little bit to that. Um, so so um, I think that um, criminalization is just one symptom of something that's even bigger and we all know it's like intolerance and stigma and discrimination. It, it not only did it lead to criminalizations, but it also lead to violence and they always come pretty much, you know, hand in hand, you know, like racial violence, you know, like, and racial profiling um, and, you know, and HIV criminalizations and also, you know, like all these like stigma around HIV. And um, I saw a comment earlier about, you know, this started when um, Ryan White was being authorized the first time that um, Congress wanted to make sure that there's something in place to prevent the spread of HIV. And at that time, there was no um, treatment. So, um, so the best that they can come up with, you know, it's just like the old days, you know, like pre Civil War, you know, like just put everybody in jail or, you know, like, and that's their way of like isolating and quarantine people living with HIV. So we all know why this is happening. Um, and we also know, like Lana said, we know that how it is different for somebody who's not black, who's not indigenous, who's not brown, um, if they're HIV positive, they have fewer consequences. The best example I can give you is that Hollywood star just not that many years ago, you know, like publicly, you know, like um, disclosed that, you know, is HIV positive and publicly disclosed that he had unprotected sex with people and there are no consequences, you know, like so, and, you know, and so like for, for folks, you know, like who can just pay people off or for folks who um, actually have a really high bottom <laughs> um, that, yeah, so um, that they would never really get to experience, you know, like the devastation, you know, and, and you know, and the, the real impact of being criminalized and having that on, on the record. Um, in many states, you know, like HIV uh, criminalizations would lead to sex offender registry. That hasn't really changed, you know, and that is um, also um, similar to sex work in some states as well. So, you know, like, and and that's the scarlet letters that people have to brand, just like being LGBT now is like, continue to see increasing um, passing of laws and bills, you know, to criminalize people who are LGBT and also to criminalize the entire ecosystem. Um, so it's really important, I think, that for us to be dedicating this space, and I think that that was part of the discussions earlier on, that we want to create a coalition that can be the political home for those who are interested in abolitions and who are interested in decriminalizations to find ways, you know, to get together to really create, you know, like a, a more comprehensive dialogue, you know, because it touched on so many different communities. It does. This work is so intersectional. Um, Charles, I really heard you talk about our activism and the importance of narrative shifting. Why is it really important to include visions and also practices around abolitionist work and abolitionist framework when talking about the HMP founding principles? And why is it important to really talk about decriminalizing HIV with the broader movement to abolish the prison industrial complex? Yeah, one of our 
I think one of our first conversations, if I'm not mistaken, back in December 2019, uh, in Cal at, at our first convening was around abolition. Uh, like, what does it mean to be an abolitionist group? Should we name ourselves as that? And I remember Nana had this really um, excellent uh, analysis around abolition because I always thought, I always saw it as either abol like abolitionist. It means um, I saw it in a very narrow way, and she had this very expansive vision of what abolitionism could include. It could be also a process, a journey, um, and not just <laughs> uh, the way I was thinking about it in a much more narrow way. So, um, from I guess what I'm getting at is from the beginning, those were discussions that that I remember. I hope I'm not misremembering, but from the from our first meeting, I remember us having conversations about that because at the time it felt very, um, it felt very both urgent, but also vulnerable to name ourselves as an abolitionist organization, as a collective of HIV uh, movement leaders. Um, I'll also say that so much of the work, um, historically, I think of, when I think of the HIV movement, um, and I think about my own lineage in the HIV movement, I think about the artists and writers that I see myself in the tradition of. I think of um, just so many, like storytellers, um, that in the early 80s that were putting pen to paper and, and daring to defy um, white supremacy and all the forces of structural violence and also um, talking about HIV. And I think that's just an important part of the history of our movement that, you know, it wasn't always led by pub public health wonks that there were poets and artists that were on the vanguard of our movement. And I don't know if we always, um, I don't know if they're always, that legacy is well preserved. And I think that's something we should take a lot of um, power in. I also wanna say that I think that the that narrative shift work is 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 indispensable to the HIV movement work in that we see the power of stigma, we see the power of how language and words not only hurt and harm but dehumanize and destroy and cause suffering and, and it's, it's soul crushing. And so again, I just really believe that we absolutely have to have space for narrative organizers and cultural workers and artists and storytellers to just be a part of a part of that that space. Um, but yeah, I just want to leave just leave the group with just that from the beginning, those were, we were having conversations about abolitionism from the very beginning. And that was something that I think we pretty much came to a consensus on and that we absolutely would, you know, that we would resist the carceral state in all of its forms and that we would seek to build community and build movement and share space and build coalition with all movements and all folks that were working against the prison industrial complex. Like that was something that was very important to us. Um, and if other folks have uh, uh, recollections of that that conversation, um, you know, definitely please uh, fill in the blanks. But I, I think that was the conversation I remember us having early on. I think another aspect of that conversation was the realization that it we had to not just be government facing or litig like law facing or law enforcement facing or criminal processing facing. We also had to face our communities because these laws require the active participation of some people living with HIV. And I remember very early on, just before we started like getting together to talk about it, there were a whole series of kind of reality TV level celebrities that disclosed that it was discovered they had HIV. And the first thing they did was sue the person they thought had exposed them. And they were kind of being heralded as heroes for going after other people they'd had sex with. Um, and, you know, maybe the people that they were having sex with are heroes for having sex with them because they seem like horrible people. But um, I just think this was something that was happening that we in the gay community, um, anyway, it was, it, and it happens in the gay community all the time. If you're on Grindr or Jacked, and if you don't know what those are, just, you know, um, the, there are often these kind of vigilante profiles like HIV liar, where they try to like do gotchas with um, people in their community. And to me, it's horrific to watch. And it really told us that we had to deal with our communities also and be community facing and, and have communities hold each other accountable for this kind of behavior that just exacerbated a problem that disproportionately, you know, impacted you know, people living with HIV, who are people of color, all of uh, who don't, who are poor, all of that. Definitely, we definitely have to do that. And I know that the HMP Advocacy Project really broadened my view around abolishing systems that no longer serve us and really thinking about 
the full array, array of abolitionism work and how it's not just focusing in on just one small thing, how we have to abolish all systems um, that really help to serve this nasty, vile, vicious, and carceral system. I'm going to pass it on over to Sean because it looks like he has something to add as well. Uh, Marnie, just back to the, you know, what was the landscape, um, you know, a few years ago, uh, and Andy's comment just reminded me of this, there was pretty good survey research, both in the U.S., uh, some of the University of Minnesota, and uh, uh, Catherine Dodds in the U.K., showing that about two-thirds of gay men supported HIV criminalization statutes, and of gay men with HIV, I think it was close to 40 percent at that time. Um, CERO did a huge benchmark survey. Uh, Laurel Sprague was the principal investigator. Um, I think 3,000 people with HIV in the U.S. completed. Uh, and that was about attitudes and experiences with and familiarity and so on. And, and we're just getting started on a project to update that survey, uh, you know, 11 or 12 years later or whatever, which I'm really looking forward to because it'll give us a chance to compare the perspectives of people with HIV when we did it the first time with today and see uh, how much this movement and this advocacy has uh, changed our minds about ourselves, I guess is the way to, to look at it. It definitely is. Hey, Cecilia, I know we talked a lot a bit about intersectionality, and I really want to focus on the importance um, of uplifting the decriminalization of sex work with also the decriminalization of HIV. Can you speak a little bit more about those two specific intersections? Okay, before I touch on that, I just want to let everybody know if you haven't followed the news, you know, Ghana just passed, you know, like another, um, another country that just passed, you know, like an anti-LGBTQ um, rights bill that um, tacked on with like prison sentences. And and what makes this actually worse, you know, I think that we will have more discussion at a certain point is that sponsor of somebody who um, who is LGBT also would get criminalized. So, you know, like, and, you know, like, and so think of all the HIV work that we've done so far, you know, like, and, you know, like, and, and we don't know how that's going to end. So back to back to the U.S. You know about like criminalizations of sex work and criminalization of HIV. You know for a long time. You know it goes back to my own experience. You know like when I first um, transitioned, I I struggled and you know like and I was like relying on survival sex um, to really put a roof over my head and food at the table on the table. And at the time when um, when I realized that, you know, like being HIV positive, when I get arrested, you know, that means that they can give me a sentencing enhancement and, you know, add at least six months to my sentence. You know, that's in California. In some other places, it's more. And, and on top of that, our data is pretty in, uh, invisible for transgender sex workers to be arrested. There's no da um, data or record that shows that who's transgender in in the prison system, you know, because it's not set up that way. It's very binary. Um, and, you know, and that's also like why I got involved with Just Detention International. Back then it's called Stop Prisoners Rape. Um, it's all related because you know, like when, um, when, when I started hearing stories of some of my sisters, especially in the south, um, that they've been arrested for sex work, and all of a sudden, you know, like, um, like Louisiana, there's this like crime against nature law that they ended up, you know, having to register a sex offender for life, like just because they need to survive, or just because they think that, you know, like, you know, sex work can be a, prof um, a profession for them, you know, to generate a regular income. Like, so those are not good reasons to put somebody's behind bar, but those are definitely good reasons 
to have people live in fear. I know that I lived in fear for many years, not just because of that. COVID was the same thing, you know, like when the conversations about the origin of COVID, all of a sudden we see more violence against Asian and Pacific Islanders. Um, and, and so, you know, like in order to really talk about these, you know, like we need to take away the punishment part of these conversations. You know, otherwise, you know, like we would not be able to move forward because people would think that, you know, like just punish people and lock them away is the answer. It's never the answer because you don't know like who, who's around you, who you love and who's your, in your family might actually be living with HIV or who had one time or another rely on sex work to survive. Um, and you'll be surprised, you know, like if, if that comes forward. So it's really important for us to think of that and also as a transgender woman, um, again, you know, like stories that we hear that if you have been arrested and if you are convicted of a crime in states like um, Atlanta, you won't be able to um, change your um, ID documents and, you know, and definitely not changing names and gender marker. And so it just feels like, you know, like if you have make one decision that people don't approve, your entire life is stuck, for lack of a better word. And there are many of my sisters and some of my transgender brothers, you know, like who are actually going through that. Um, and, you know, and like Charles, you know, that's why I started Positively Trans is for everyone to have a chance to tell their stories. Um, I don't want to say normalize or put a face, you know, to HIV, um, but at least, you know, like, you know, I think that stories connect people better than any, like, um, research paper could, like, it's like it's not that we have it short of any research paper, but it seems like you know what we need is to really get to people hit on their empathy button. Um, and we still have a long way to go, but what we're seeing is that there are more criminalization laws coming down the pipeline. It might not be specifically for HIV, but it's definitely being you know like created to punish who we are, you know, as women, as transgender people, as black and brown people, and um, as poor people. Thank you for that, Cecilia. And that's definitely a Twitter quote worthy statement that stories really do connect people better than policy ever will. So thank you for that. Um, I do have a, a couple of more questions. We per I personally talked about how HMP has been really impactful in my life and other advocates who are a part of that HMP advocacy coalition. I wanted to ask what has been possible because of the Health Not Prisons Collective? And anybody could start with this one. What has been possible in the HIV movement now that HMP exists for all of us? I know personally for me, it was opening up my mind and allowing me to explore more ways in which abolitionism uh, looks like beyond just HIV criminalization and letting me connect the dots with other um, organizing and other organizing work that happens. So I'll jump in first. I, it, um, it looks like for me, you know, like um, someone who works in a trans-led organization, it, means, you know, like it took me 15 years to get my organizations finally to see, you know, how HIV criminalizations and the rest of our work intersect. And that's also, you know, like what we have done this year is we filed, you know, like a case to sue the state of Tennessee for, um, for their, um, uh, what's that called, I, 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 um, to put people in isolations, you know, like, and usually it ends up being gay and trans people being put in isolation, you know? And um, and so like to have that, I think it's a big step forward because now, you know, like more legal organizations start talking about these strategies, you know? And, um, and the good part is if we can actually end criminalizations on one thing, that means that we potentially can end criminalizations on the other part of our identities, you know, and that's actually why health not prison is a good name because we are putting health first and, you know, and not prison. 
definitely. We're definitely talking about people first, which is what we should always be talking about. Andrew, I'm going to throw it on over to you. Yeah, just to follow up with Cecilia, I think that because of the work we've done kind of growing Health Not Prisons Collective, coordinating events all over the um, country, uh, resourcing people to throw community events to educate people about uh, HIV criminalization and moving the needle, even in the philanthropic world, like funders, you know, now taking criminalization seriously. Um, it's helped us be able to organize in the U.S. Um, and, and in other countries around this issue of criminalization. So, for instance, Ghana did pass a law today. It's now we're waiting to see if the president will sign the bill. He probably will. Um, and but Uganda passed a really vicious law last year. And it was it was helpful to have that as the base for being able to push HIV advocates who I don't think normally would take a real stand on criminalization. And now people, it's definitely on the radar of like, this is something we have to stand against. Um, I don't know if people are aware of it, but there was a, there's a uh, queer Mexican man named Manuel who's HIV positive being held in Qatar right now um, uh, uh, because he's queer and HIV positive in Qatar. And there's a whole movement now in both Mexico and the US to push the state departments to get him out of prison because it's insane. Um, and this is, you know, allegedly an ally of the U.S., an ally country of the U.S. that hosted the World Cup. Um, and uh, I bring that up just because I think it's it's ridiculous um, and it's insane. And But there are people that are now really attuned to that and the impact of it. I think the larger conversations with Health Not Prisons Collective has been able to push the HIV movement to also understand how migrants are being penalized by uh, and being um, criminalized by the U.S. government. Um, and how that is impacted. So these cases where we have people living with HIV denied treatment and dying um, in, in migrant camps, I think HIV advocates are now much more attuned to why that's in it, you know, how that's connected. Um, and I think it's the work that we've done. I'm proud of it. Yeah, I'd love to add into this as well. Um, I think like, there's so much about the work of Health Not Prisons that I think is really exciting. And one of the things I think is really um, that every partner has brought their unique um, strengths and skills and leveraged those through a shared theory, theory of change about how we move the needle on these issues. So Health Not Prisons collectively, these five organizations you see here, here are doing a whole variety of different tactics, but we're doing them in a very coordinated way. So we have counter narrative project, you know, leveraging their expertise in shaping stories and narratives and changing the conversation and changing the culture. You have Ciro Project, which is really about centering survivors of HIV criminalization and centering people living with HIV and helping to build people living with HIV as leaders. You have PWN and Ciro collaborating on a lot of leadership development with a strong focus on um, on BIPOC people living with HIV, Black, Indigenous, people of color living with HIV that we're coaching and training and supporting through the Health Not Prisons Advocates Program, which is an extended program through um, partnerships around the HIV is Not a Crime Training Academy um, that's bringing people together to like think deeply, learn skills, strategize together. Um, and then you have like TLC uh, doing impact litigation as, and uh, you know, like doing legal strategies and things like that. And the caucus that's working to both like center and elevate the voices of people living with HIV and also helping us create this vehicle that we're in together to move this at the federal level around accountability with the um, Office of National AIDS Policy and federal agencies around what they're doing on HIV criminalization laws. And so this is all part of, you know, kind of a unified strategy. And we're working together at the state level in multiple states where organizations are able to bring their skills to like move policy support coalitions that are doing this work, support individual leaders in elevating their voice and resource those coalitions and leaders to have an impact. Um, and I think this is, you know, this is how we have to do we have to do a variety of tactics. We don't win in any one way. And I think you can see it, you know, look at the organizing that's happening right now around Palestine. 
We have folks successfully doing direct actions and bringing so much attention. We have court cases happening, international and domestic court cases. Um, we have the boycott, divest, and sanction movement happening, BDS. We have Starbucks workers organizing and starting to win on things. We had 100,000 voters in Michigan yesterday write in uncommitted because of their commitment to a ceasefire in the presidential primary. Like this is what it looks like to leverage lots of different tactics as a movement and move us along towards victory because nothing else is acceptable. And I think when we look at results like um, when we see, you know, leadership in the movement also changing, those are some of our wins as well that we don't claim just as HMP, but part of, they're part of the world that we're working towards. We have Mandisa Moore, um, leading, you know, CHLP. We have um, Kamaria and Tammy co-leading Ciro. We have Ciro shifting to a co-directorship model. We have Marnina and Kiva leading PWN. Like, look at these changes that are happening in our community itself. And in our movement itself. I think it's clear that we are moving in the right direction. I think we are. And wow, Nana, y'all have accomplished so much as a collective over the past four years. It's really amazing. Um, I want to ask, what is the greatest accomplishment out of all of the stuff that you all have talked about, all of the amazing achievements, all of the things that we've been able to accomplish as a movement because of you all's vision for HMP? What is the greatest accomplishment of the Health Not Prisons Collective over the past four, four to five years? And I'm going to throw it on over to Andrew. And also, Andrew, I want to thank you for bringing... Um, not only Manuel, but also other immigrants and migrant workers into this conversation. Thanks. I think I think our biggest accomplishment is that we've, you know, is you know, our biggest success is that others are now like taking criminalization. Like it's a standard part of AIDS Watch. It's a standard part of, you know, many of these conversations that I don't think happened. Um, you know, I've been in the field a long time and like Sean, um, you know, really experienced how how reactionary many HIV organizations have been on this issue historically. And so it's great to see um, players, like people that have been around for a while, finally taking this seriously. I also think that one of the things that's done, and this is just from a community building point of view, is I think we as people living with HIV often get ridiculed for our concerns that HIV negative people don't share. And this has been a bedrock to really embolden people living with HIV and connect people living with HIV to say, no, this affects me, this affects us, and it's important. Um, and not to stand by and let people marginalize us the way that they have with our concerns. Um, so I'm really proud of that, that we've been able to shift that. What about you, Sean? What has been the greatest accomplishment of the Health Not Prisons Collective over the last four years? You know, the, 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 the level of trust at which the, the collective operates, um, you know, so often over the course of the epidemic are challenges, adversaries, sometimes enemies are institutions. And we as people with HIV have never had institutions of the size and scale to sort of compete institution to institution. But collectively, we do. You know, the Health Not Prisons collective of those organizations, our combined budgets and staff and so on, they're individual components. But when we're going in the same direction, we have a very, very, very powerful base that has taken a leadership role in the epidemic far beyond you know hiv criminalization and so i think that is a, 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 a really a great great success uh, in a similar way to to uh, the caucus you know i think these organizational collaborations that have worked so well and you know and function with a really high level of trust and respect for the different opinions we're all educating each other in, in the process uh, you know, I, I think it's a it's a remarkable success and really gives me hope for the future. I think the future is bright because all of y'all exist and because of HMP. 
I'm gonna pass it on over to Charles. What do you see as the greatest accomplishment of the Health Not Prisons Collective over the past four years? Absolutely. I just want to echo certainly what Sean was sharing that, first of all, our combined network of, of, of um, constituents that we share probably 50,000 or more folks just within our you know social media networks and our membership list, and our email lists, um, certainly just you know tens of thousands, about 100,000 or maybe more than that. Um, and I think that's just so much like people power. Um, also, um, you know, the, the um, HMP uh, fellowship uh, program that we have and just the advocates that we train, certainly um, the amazing impact litigation work led by Transgender Law Center, I think has just been absolutely um, extraordinary and courageous and brave and uh, transformative. Um, just a leadership pipeline, um, the HMP sort of incubates informally uh, within the networks that we have and just all the leadership development opportunities that exist. And also just the policy advocacy. I think we've um, been certainly at many state tables, a part of many state coalitions engaged in HIV advocacy and also at the federal level. I can say that, you know, certainly being based in Georgia, um, the, 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 the law that was changed in Georgia a few years ago was certainly um, a part of the, the HMP universe that was created. Um, and that's why I think that as you're starting to see the sh even these shifts, these policy shifts, I think HMP certainly has played a part in that. Definitely. And last but not least, Cecilia, I wanted to hear your perspective on this question as well, too. What has really been one of the greatest accomplishments of HMP so far? You're muted. Just want to let you know. Accomplishment. I think that there's what the accomplishment. You lost your sound again, CC. You're muted. I'm gonna come back to you. Um, I just wanna act at the closing since we're about to close. Uh, oh, it looks like you got it. Oh, <laughs> it's messing up on you. Just as we're getting ready to close in recognition of PINAC, what has been the greatest hope for the Health Not Prisons Collective and what does a world where HIV is not a crime look like to you all? No, it's an ambitious goal. It's something that we're all working towards. But what does a world where HIV is not a crime really look like? And I'm with, I want everyone to answer, but I kind of want to throw it on over to Sean first. <laughs> she started us off. Uh, well, it certainly is a world with, with more justice, but. Uh, you know, it isn't just about HIV not being a crime. I mean, early in the call, you were talking about criminalization around COVID, is criminalization around TB, is criminalization, loads of criminalization around uh, mental illness. Um, it's really a world where we, where we prioritize people's health uh, rather than locking people up in cages. Uh, that's, that's the world we're, we're envisioning. Definitely, definitely. Charles, what does that look like for you? What is your greatest hope for the Health Not Prisons Collective? The word that just keeps coming to mind is just freedom, just freedom and joy. And that is the world that I'm certainly committed to, to working for, to dying for, just a world where we can all be free. I put a little pep in my step towards the end of the day, joy and freedom. I love it. Nana, what about you? Yeah, um, I think, first of all, I, I also want to like appreciate that we are 
honoring HIV is not a crime awareness day today. And I never know quite what to say. It's not like happy Hynak day. Like it's not really a happy day, but, um, but I want to honor the, the labor and the leadership that it's taken to like create this day and that it's been, you know, and certainly the leadership and labor from Sean, like you kind of like paving the way in a lot of this movement on behalf of people living with HIV is really critical to uplift and recognize. And I know that hasn't always been easy. Um, and that like, this is a movement. So shout out to everybody who's here today and who's been participating in all kinds of HIV is not a crime awareness day activities today. Um, I know that folks have been on multiple events and panels and thank you for joining us for this one as well. And thank you for everything you do every single day. And I think to me, um, you know, the, this is, this is actually what winning looks like is like this power that we're building by, for, with our people. Um, so yeah, like the, I guess like the victory or the, you know, the, when we win that, that looks like liberation for our communities. And it also looks like we don't stop until full liberation for our communities. Um, and that we continue in a principled struggle towards liberation together, um, and with care and with healing. liberation and freedom and also like making sure that we're doing this together all goes hand in hand so thank you for that Nana. Andrew what about you what is your greatest hope for HIV and what does a world without uh HIV criminalization look like to you um you know I I think that a world without HIV criminalization for me is a world without prisons and a world without um these these multi-billion dollars invested in um, trying to control bodies versus, you know, our liberation and our health. Um, and, and for me, that's what victory looks like. Victory, you know, is the answer to the to Nina Simone asking, I wish I knew how it would feel to be free. Um, you know, that to me is the victory. Um, and I'm proud to be part of this group. Well, that really concluded all of my questions. Thank you all so much. Um, I do have some questions that are in the chat. We do have a few more questions that folks are asking, and I want to make sure we get to those. Uh, one of the questions is, how do you all feel about HIV criminalization um, being tied to funding? Um, do you, and do you think uh, HIV criminalization is going to be tied to any upcoming funding? So I think what you're referencing was the first Brian White Care Act, which for states to qualify for funding, uh, there was a title of it that required them under one title of it, required states to demonstrate they could prosecute what was called intentional transmission. Uh, at the time, any kind of intimate contact was considered intentional transmission. Uh, about half the states said we have assault statutes, we can prosecute someone if they intend to hurt someone, whether they use a gun or a baseball bat or a virus. A bunch of other states went out and passed this patchwork collection of, of insane statutes. Uh, there's been some discussion about uh, building in some similar incentive for states to reform their statutes. And I think that's an important strategy. It's not the solution. You know, the, you know changing a law in a state isn't the total solution. It's really important, but it goes uh, far beyond that. Um, but but I'm interested in, uh, you know, if Ryan White reauthorization ever is uh, discussed and debated this way, um, the idea of putting something in it to further incent states to improve their statutes uh, around uh, criminalization of health conditions, uh, I think is a really good idea. I, I just want to highlight something that is coming up like that that happened in the past and what we're seeing now is there's this rampant move on the hill to add riders to every law that's passed that include um not you know that don't endorse sexual reproductive health and rights and specifically target trans people and um other lgbt lgb communities but mostly it's trans people that are being targeted by these riders and we need to be very vigilant and support um and 
talk to our legislators about whether they support these kinds of riders, whether they're aware of them and the harm that these riders can do in our communities. We've seen what happened with HIV criminalization. It's just going to get worse if we don't stop it. Um, we can't give any ground. I'm, I'm so tired of the moderate think tank saying, well, maybe there's a compromise. There's no compromise. We can't give grounds to these monsters. Yeah, definitely agreed with that. And I think we should also be mindful that um, while a lot of the laws that are being changed now are, you know, from a long time ago, not all of them are. There are new laws constantly being either proposed or adopted that criminalize people with communicable diseases, including HIV, but not limited to HIV. And many times those are coming under the guise of other types of things. We recently had to fight and defeat, uh, or not defeat, um, actually, <laughs> um, but stall a, a, for a while a bill in Pennsylvania that increased criminalization of a number of communicable diseases. And it was framed under the guise of a Blue Lives Matter bill that was protecting cops from protesters. So when we talk about the impacts of pandemic policing and what happened with the uprising, um, this was actually one of the negative consequences. This is one of the way they tried to punish communities for rising up in opposition to police brutality against black bodies was by introducing bills that criminalized protests. And they used communicable diseases as a tool in that process and successfully passed because it's very hard to, um, to build bipartisan opposition for anything that looks like it is pro-law enforcement. And so, um, so unfortunately, that is a bill that passed and that actually increased opportunities to criminalize people living with HIV and a range of other diseases. And so, and this is just in the last couple of years. So we need to be mindful that like, as Andy's framing this context for us also, everything is on the line. Um, not to be a downer, you know, towards the end of our conversation, but everything is on the line. Um, surveillance around health issues, data privacy issues, attacks on queer and trans people, including and especially focused on queer and trans youth. How outrageous is that? Uh, reproductive freedom. Um, and certainly, you know, anything that's associated with like communities that they would love to lock up or put away or just not look at or deal with. Um, so, yeah, we have to just keep fighting and stay vigilant. Now my mute button isn't working just like Cecilia's earlier. I see we got Queen CC back. Um, thank you so much for coming back with us. And I just want to ask you too, uh, that last question before, um, what do you think is the greatest hope for the Health Not Prisons Collective? And what does a world where HIV is not a crime look like to you? I think that we are kind of like starting to do that now that, um, you know, like that, um, we are being seen um, as the go-to for funders, you know, when it comes to like putting anything uh, about HIV criminalizations together. And also, I think that that's, that's a big giant step forward. You know, that means that we can continue to educate more funders and make the case of why they need to fund um, this movement. Um, and the other, the other things that I want to say is, the biggest change that I see is now that the organizations I work for um, actually talks about HIV. You know, like before, I think that we all compartmentalize our work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and for people who work in transgender, they don't talk about HIV at all as if, you know, like something bad would happen. But actually something bad would happen if we look the other way. And we are seeing more and more of that evidence today. Um, I don't want to be a downer also, but, um, and even PEPFARS almost got tied to an LGBT, anti-LGBT provisions in order for it to be reauthorized. And we have to stay vigilant and on top of this. This is not a time to relax and kick back. This is the time to step up and move forward. 
Thank you for that, Cecilia. And there is nothing like, there's nothing, you're not being a downer at all, you nor Nana. I think this is really inspiring us, motivating us and mobilizing folks to really get engaged with HIV decriminalization. Like in the chat, I'm saying no compromises, never give up the fight. Folks are really ready to step in and step out and say, hey, we are not gonna take any of this laying down and all of our oppression and liberation is interconnected. I wanna thank you all so much for being a part of this panel. I wanna thank you all so much for starting h &P, for having a vision to make sure that none of us um, and all of us are connected into this work together. So thank you all so much. I'm gonna pass it on over to Elena so that she can help end us out and close us on out. Um, all right, thank you, Marnina. I hope I'm being spotlighted right now. I'm not sure if I am or not, but um, thank you so much to our amazing panelists for this great conversation on HIV is not a crime awareness day. Um, you know, if you want to get connected with H&P a little bit more, there are a few ways you can get connected with us. H&P, uh, a lot of our partner organizations, as well as our H&P advocates, uh, will be at AIDS Watch this year. So that's coming up on March 17th through the 19th. So if you are there, uh, please come and say hi to us. Uh, we may have some merch. So if you want some cool H&P merch, uh, come find one of our partner organizations and we'll hook you up. Um, if you want to learn more about us just in general, uh, please visit our website. And if you want to get on our email list, uh, you can scan the QR code here and uh, you can stay connected with us. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we also are in the midst of our H&P Advocate slash PWN Policy Fellow policy and advocacy training webinar series that's happening right now and has been happening over the past couple of months. Uh, if you want to attend, uh, while th these trainings are kind of geared towards our agent P advocates and our policy fellows, uh, they are open to the public. So our next session will be March, th March 14th, and it will be on storytelling for advocacy. So just in time for AIDS Watch, um, yeah, you can, I think Kelly has already dropped the link in the chat there so you can register um, for those upcoming trainings. Um, next slide. Finally, uh, again, we you can not only sign up for our listserv, you can also follow us on all the social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or Twitter, I will never say X, it's Twitter. Um, uh, please follow us at H&P Collective uh, so you can see uh, all the cool things that we're up to. Next slide, please. Just a little, I couldn't let this day go by without this little surprise slide uh, for Nana. Uh, it's their last day as a staff member at PWN, so I couldn't let it go by without uh, recognizing them and shouting them out for how much they contributed to just our HIV decrim movement period, but H&P specifically in terms of helping to build this collective. So we are sad to see you go, Nana, but... Uh, we are really grateful for how hard you have worked to build all of us up and to build this movement up. So if you love Nana, please show some love in the chat for them and wish them well as they go into their next chapter, hopefully with some radical rest uh, and some Sheba uh, cuddles. Um, uh, that is all we have for you all tonight. Uh, if you didn't or if you want to, again, stay connected with us, please follow us on all of our social media pages um, and stay tuned for what H&P has to come. Um, thank you all so much to our panelists. Thank you, Marnina, for moderating this beautiful panel. Uh, panelists, if you could please stay on. We're going to take a